Released in early 2000, we have Capcom's last Resident Evil game released on the Sony PlayStation. The timing here is cutting it awfully close though, since the next mainline game was released only a few days later. And its release outside of Japan ended up coming out several months later after a snazzy next-gen Resident Evil game had already dazzled the public with its Dreamcast graphics. Don't worry, the history on this one will be fairly quick, because apparently there is very little to say. No recognizable names in the credits, no one of note that had worked on the previous or future game, nor a recognizable production studio unless Capcom Production Studio 3 really gets your blood pumping. The game was primarily developed by Tosei, not Capcom, a common outsourcing video game development company that is used by basically everybody. So while Capcom was busy working on the rest of the games, I guess they just threw Tosei some scraps and said make something out of this. The game has not been held in memory very well. If you're watching this video then you likely fall into one of two camps. Either you've never heard of this game before because it isn't a numbered sequel in the franchise, or you have heard of it but nothing good. I mean, you know a game isn't held in very high regard when it has an angry video game nerd episode dedicated to it. How's that for a slice of fried ass? Pretty much the only thing to note about this game going in is that it was designed from the ground up to support a new handheld gun controller called the GunCon, which tells you right away that this is a gimmick game. But what happens when an unremarkable gimmick game loses its only defining feature? Well, in North America, the GunCon capabilities were removed at launch due to the hysteria surrounding the Columbine school shooting. You know, that whole video games, especially the ones with toy guns, are going to make people violent thing. I would probably go as far to say that the game was likely intended to be played with the GunCon controller, but in order to play this game as it was originally intended, I would need to buy myself a foreign copy of the game, along with a PlayStation that can play games from that region, an old CRTV so it can pick up the light signals, and a means to record high quality footage from AV cables. Uh, yeah, that's not happening for now. Besides, if the rest of North America had to play with a controller, then I'm just getting the authentic experience. So now, let's take a look into Resident Evil Survivor. Upon starting Resident Evil Survivor, we are shown a text scroll that can't even keep up with the narrator reading it. However, this was not the only location where an outbreak occurred. Weirdly though, this prologue focuses mostly on the Raccoon City outbreak, even though that has little to no relevance on this game specifically besides Umbrella's involvement. Also, while Umbrella had some involvement in the decision to nuke Raccoon City, at this point we just know that it was made by the United States government, not Umbrella. Then we get a very comical cutscene of a man proudly saying, You're not going to get away! as he tries to wrestle an active helicopter. I guess he manages to shoot something important or something, and that causes the helicopter to suddenly crash and explode. After cooking for the appropriate amount of time, a man is launched out of the downed chopper for no reason. He seems to have experienced no damage from being in a horrible wreck that is besides a bad case of amnesia. He has no idea who or where he is, but thankfully he landed with a fully loaded handgun, an infinite amount of ammunition for it, and enough grey matter in his skull to know how to operate the thing skillfully. Then he repeats everything the text has told us. Where... where am I? Oh! I... I don't remember... anything. Who am I? Oh, we're back to that Resident Evil 1, let's just pull a random English-speaking person off the street, quality voice acting! Unfortunately for us though, a large part of what made Resident Evil 1's voice acting extremely enjoyable was not only the terrible delivery, but the extremely awkward lines written for these inexperienced actors. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. This game certainly has a handful of weird lines, but you aren't going to get anything like Master of Unlocking or Jill sandwiches again. So it's enjoyable for sure, but it's not as enjoyable. So the first thing you're going to notice about the gameplay is that this is a first-person shooter. Or more accurately, a first-person shooter before a standard for first-person shooter controls were normalized. Basically, all the tank controls of your standard Resident Evil game are in play here, with the only exception being your viewpoint and how you aim. 
Once you press the aim button, you are locked in place and you have to manually move the reticle to where you want to shoot on screen. This is something that could have worked on paper. In fact, plenty of later Resident Evil games do it successfully. Not having the full vision of your surroundings and having to rely on auditory signals can serve as the survival horror atmosphere, and having a monster suddenly pop into your view can be very startling. But unfortunately, that's about as much quality as I can pull out of the setup here. The fact you aren't able to move the camera up and down, but you still have to manually target all enemies, including the small ones that reach their greatest level of danger when they're staring up your nostrils, often leads to moments of frustration as you don't have many options to retaliate at that point. And from the presentation perspective, let's just say that most things on the PlayStation 1 don't look great. Especially not good enough that you'd want to stick your face right up against their pixely textures. The way that the PlayStation 1 rendered things also kind of just broke if you did that. So as you play, you will constantly see the textures on the walls sort of bend and warp as you turn. There's also plenty of areas where, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a sky. That's a way too small sky dome. The PlayStation just wasn't made to be rendering this much detail at once, especially not from a first person angle. So in many places, lag is very prominent, especially when there are multiple enemies on screen at once. But like I said, future games managed to do this exact same premise significantly better. Oh, Resident Evil Survivor, you were just too far ahead of your time. Our protagonist finds the body of the guy who is trying to suplex a helicopter, and sees that he's holding dog tags with the name Ark Thompson engraved upon them. Our mystery protag struggles to remember anything before he turns around to be greeted by a SPOOKY ZOMBIE! Ark Thompson, huh? Though I can't remember anything, I know that this was no way for anyone to die. What? Wow, so that that was the intro to the first enemy. The zombie just awkwardly stands there for a second with no music of any kind, and I immediately pump it full of lead in less than a second. Exhilarating, I'm so afraid. After you pick up the key that the zombie drops, you are given the option to travel down three different paths that eventually meet up again. This is something that happens multiple times in the game, likely as an excuse for replayability. And that's good and all, but I wish they gave some kind of initial warning about these being points of no return. On my first playthrough, I was wanting to backtrack and explore different rooms to see what I might have missed, but I kept hitting these doors that arbitrarily lock you out. I just want to pick up anything that might help me out. <laughs> Look at me trying to play this like a real Resident Evil game. Our options at this crossroad are to go into either a theater, a restaurant, or a church, each one filled with just zombies. The game makes sure that you aren't missing out on any crucial backstory by having a resident in each of these locations talk about how Umbrella called a meeting to talk about how crazy that whole Raccoon City thing was. It's good to make sure that nobody misses the lore, but it makes for a lot of repeated content on multiple playthroughs. What all these areas serve as are simple locations for you to get used to the combat controls. Like I said before, the controls from other Resident Evil games carry over here, or at least most of them do. Despite coming out after Resident Evil 3, it's missing the massively important quick turn, meaning that now you have to slowly rotate around in the first person! If you're playing with the gun con, your reticle would be wherever you physically aim the gun, but for us poor Americans, we have to manually move this very precise crosshair onto enemies. For most enemies, this is not a problem at all, but when it comes to the smaller, faster enemies, this can become incredibly frustrating. Once a shot lands on an enemy, that's, uh, that's kind of game over for them. The game automatically locks your aim onto them, which is only able to be broken by fast enemies that can very quickly break line of sight. Once locked on, you just mash the fire button until they keel over. Technically, you can deal more damage by shooting specific body parts, usually the head, but why bother with that when shooting in the torso is faster and ensures better accuracy thanks to the lock-on? It'll choppily whip around your screen as the game keeps refocusing on your target, but it works, and it turns shooting into something that is incredibly, extremely mindless. The only effort that you're going to be putting in is how to position yourself when you unload into everything coming at you. This seems like the game's idea of a challenge, at least 75% of the time. Any damage you take in these earlier parts will be from you not realizing that a zombie has spawned right next to you or just outside of your peripheral vision. Likely to add some kind of constant action, since killing all the zombies in a room only takes a few seconds, is that enemies respawn in many areas. But like I said, they're not very difficult to kill, and ammo isn't an issue here because you have infinite handgun bullets, so this is what I would describe as a time-wasting feature.
Not much else happens in these beginning areas, so let's just go into this theater and... Whoa! That music kicked in hard, despite the danger being almost non-existent. Cuts out just as suddenly upon killing everything in the room, too. While we're here, we can also find a report by Nikolai for Umbrella detailing the previous outbreaks. He recommends that security on the virus be improved and the workers be re-educated. I'm sorry, did you not already have the highly contagious virus and cornerstone to your bioweapon trait under maximum security? And what kind of idiots did you have working for you in your super secret underground bunker before these incidents where you actually have to re-educate them? Guys, just stop all the outbreaks, okay? Management's getting real tired of it. This stuff is really important. Then he starts talking about how Nemesis was such a badass that they lost all the UBCS members. Except that Nemesis was programmed to hunt down Star's members, not just kill whatever it finds. If he's trying to cover up something, he could have just said that they were killed by any other monster, not the one that is programmed not to do the thing he said. So I'm not sure exactly what he's trying to say here. Now in order to exit the theater, we have to play a movie on the projector, which for some reason makes a key appear on stage. Then we can go right out the next door. Surprisingly, that was actually one of the more complex series of events that takes place in this game for progression. Get used to this pattern. There are two doors. One is locked. The other just directly leads you to the key. Survivor is an incredibly linear game. For some reason, it takes the same progression of finding key items to progress later that was in previous Resident Evil games, but it simplifies it down into like one or two steps and gets rid of literally everything that made it meaningful. It's not difficult to maneuver around enemies, there's no limited ammunition so you don't have to pick and choose who you avoid and kill. There's not even a limited inventory for you to choose between ammo, health, or key items. I mean, there is an inventory, but it acts like you have a permanent safe room storage box on your jacket at all times. This is taking Resident Evil aspects and diluting them down to the point of them not even needing to exist. So it's pretty clear that all these gameplay factors that I mentioned should add up to one obvious conclusion that Resident Evil Survivor is not a survival horror game. It's trying to be an arcadey action shooter, and that's fine, perfectly fine. The problem is that it doesn't do much to make that part stand out exactly. If that is what they wanted, then I don't see why so much of the previous games had to be dragged into this. In fact, quite a lot of the previous games were literally dragged into this one, including enemies, their AI, the control schemes, many of the textures, along with the general idea and tropes of the series so far. So much of this game is reused assets. It reeks of Capcom just throwing their leftovers into a pot and somehow managing to sell the resulting leftover soup as a full-fledged game, just because it lets you use a shiny new spoon to eat it. A lot of the reused content ends up translating extremely poorly. Like how zombies would usually grab you in other Resident Evil games. But since this game is in the first person, that can't be depicted well without polygons clipping into your eyeballs. So the zombies often just flub their grab attempts. Their death animations are extremely unusual as well, as it seems like a weird mashup of other animations rather than their traditional death one. Rather than just falling to the ground, they do a little stumble from when they take too much damage, before instantly gaining terminal velocity and falling to the ground. Why don't you just use the death animation that was already there? Why'd you have to make it look like Poopy? After exiting the starting locations, our protagonist finds that a phone is ringing. Oh, but darn, we just missed it. We head downstairs to encounter the first liquor. No intro, no explanation to what it's doing here, just a liquor having a good time, I guess. In Resident Evil 2, liquors were a fairly decent, stronger enemy type, but since they've carried over their moveset and mechanics from the original game, they're kind of a joke here. Moving around them takes no effort, but if you just unload into them, then there's a good chance that you'll end up slowing them down or triggering their knockback animation when they jump at you. Yeah, that's something that wasn't really expected to be implemented into a game like this. Most enemies have a slowdown effect when they take a bullet, but if you put them in a game where you can rapidly unload a whole magazine in a second, then you have yourself a gun that not only deals damage, but also slows enemies to a crawl. Anyway, we casually walk around the liquors and, oh hey nice, another ringing phone. Vincent. Who is this? Vincent? Who's that? Wait, am I Vincent? Vincent, you are a murderer. A murderer. A murderer? What are you talking about? Answer me. Who did I kill? Uh, what? 
What? Some random guy calls you on a random payphone and speaks in an unclear, deranged manner, and you jump straight to everything that this man says must be my backstory. Would that have worked with anything said to you? Yes, I'm looking for a friend of mine. Last name Jazz, first name Hugh. Hugh Jazz? Is my name Hugh Jazz? And without jumping too far ahead, let me just go ahead and say that whatever you're likely predicting about the story, yeah, yeah, you're correct. The bar is insanely low here, and yes, it is that obvious. From here, we are given another three-way choice, but this time it'll actually impact how the story progresses. You can go to the hospital to see that helicopter guy is somehow still alive, along with a mini-boss fight from Mr. X. He may seem like an intimidating boss encounter, but really, you can take him down in a few seconds. It's even possible to abuse the manual reload function in your inventory to just demolish him. The next option is to go into the library, where you can meet some goblin man who clearly refers to our protagonist as Vincent, and warns about some cleaners that are coming to kill everybody. Helicopter! Vincent! This is all your fault! You made them send those cleaners to destroy this place! Cleaners? What do you mean? Then he tries to trap you in a room with a hunter. Then he unlocks the door when his plan doesn't work. I don't know. Or we can go to the last option, which sends us through an arcade and introduces us to the cleaners. As they rapple up, um, no wait, uh, rapple down several helicopters at the demand of Discount Hunk. Remember your mission! We're doing a clean sweep of the area! Everyone and everything must be cleansed! Now move out! Seriously, this guy gets basically no development and has a bad case of Bane mouth where I can't fucking understand half of what he says. But it's basically summed up as, I want to kill people, girl, I mean. Dude doesn't even have a name. This is called the Undertaker Commander. He sends in the Undertaker Unit, which is comprised of the so-called cleaners. Now, if you're like me, you would think that you're just fighting some weird stoogemen with guns. I mean, these guys look nothing like the previous monsters we fought in any other Resident Evil game. They kind of just look like they dressed up a bunch of orangutans in tactical gear and gave them MP5s. And they make unusual jungle cat noises upon dying. <laughs> But no, these are seriously B.O.W.s created by Umbrella. Wait, so how long did Umbrella have these? You guys had expendable clone soldiers that can handle firearms were expected to die and which left no trace upon dying. Why didn't you just send these guys into Raccoon City during the outbreak instead of wasting time and resources on the UBCS? Whatever, these guys are a joke. They may be B.O.W.s, but they go down just as fast as any person would, with a single shot or two. And despite them all being armed with ranged weapons, their tactic seems to mostly be doing somersaults in your general direction. Their only threat is if they're far away and have a bead on you, as that forces you to maneuver your crosshairs into a very specific position before they shoot you with their hitscan weapons and reset your aim, which is a mechanic that all enemies have that usually causes more harm than good. If I'm trying to run away, then I don't want to turn around to the thing that's currently killing me Stop it! Anyway, the cleaners suck. They are the only original common enemy that Survivor introduces into the series. And spoiler, they never show up again. All of these paths lead to the sewer home of the janitor, Andy, that goblin person from the library. Here, his journal, along with basically every other note that we pick up, tells us that this Vincent guy is a huge dick and he likes killing people and he's done some shitty stuff. And he also managed to take a picture of Vincent, but lo and behold, it is our protagonist! No, this is me. I am Vincent. It was all my fault. Then a small British child comes in to do the stanky dance in fear of Mr. Protagonist. Yeah, the animations in this game are really fucking weird. I get the impression that they were done by somebody inexperienced with game animation, or they were just quickly churned out like the rest of this game. What's also weird is that so many of these cutscenes are pre-rendered, which causes this ugly dithering effect. Pretty much everything in the previous games, excluding the CGI cutscenes, were rendered in-game, which made for clean transitions between cutscenes and gameplay. Here we often have to cut away, which isn't a huge deal, but it is a mark of lesser quality. 
We exit Andy's place to enter a prison called Paradise. Here we get what is pretty much the only side story present in Survivor through notes. A bunch of teenagers from across the world were captured and placed into this prison. After learning that each one of the prisoners were one by one being taken to a factory and killed, they banded together for a coup, which ended in all of their deaths at the hands of Commander Vincent. This is a bleak enough story to exist in a horror franchise like Resident Evil, but it seems like most of the files you pick up regarding it exist for everyone, staff included, to tell us how Vincent is a big meanie doo-doo head. It seems that Vincent tried to pass off the mass murder of its inmates as a mass suicide in order for him to still get a promotion, but I'd think that suddenly losing all of the important inmates that you're supposed to be caring for would be a huge black mark against you, suicide or not. I mean, it's still your job to keep the prisoners alive, right? If not, then who can cares how they die. If you had picked the correct path in the previous areas, then you could have found pistols with varying levels of power and speed. Handgun B has a very fast fire rate, but decreased firepower. But if you pair up that freezing effect that happens when enemies are hit by a bullet with this incredibly fast fire rate, then you have yourself a gun that can slow enemies to a crawl. Handgun C is just as balanced as A, except it deals more damage and it reloads faster at the cost of holding two less rounds. So I guess that means it doesn't really have a downside. And then there's Handgun D. It's very powerful, but it doesn't hold as many bullets and it takes a very long time to reload. Handguns B and C are basically immediate upgrades to Handgun A. You can go the entire game using just them and you'll demolish everything. And here in the prison we'll find a shotgun in the showers. It acts pretty much exactly how you would expect. Though, while it does deal more damage close up, it has a surprisingly far range. The Magnum, which is found later in the game, can pretty much be described in the same way. But unlike the handguns, we only receive a limited amount of ammunition for these and anything else we might pick up. Ammo is pretty limited in this game unless you know what type of enemy to farm it from. But since almost everything can be killed easily with handguns on their infinite ammo, it becomes a no-brainer to save all this ammunition for bosses. Oh great, I died. Oh shit, wait. Was I supposed to be saving this whole time? I never saw any typewriters. Did I just waste an hour of my life? Oh, huh. Survivor kind of plays like an arcade game in that you get a certain number of continues on death rather than returning to a save or checkpoint. There are no saves, so I guess beating this game requires that you do it in one sitting. Anything that you have in your inventory actually carries over into your next playthrough upon either completing the game or dying and not continuing. And that means it's totally possible to just hoard all of your ammunition until one run where you just go nuts with the most powerful guns. Not a whole lot of strategy in it. Well now we need to escape from the prison, so we can choose to either do it like the prisoners attempted and rappel down the watchtower, or we can crawl through a vent in the moth room. Now I would highly recommend the tower because the vents lead to several rooms with hunters, which lead to a new level of aggravation here because they take quite a lot of damage. They are basically the only common enemy that you need to worry about outrunning your auto aim, and they will cut you off and push you around constantly if you try to avoid them. They have the same nasty habit of jumping behind you as they did in Resident Evil 1, which is just as bad here because we're back to our terrible turning speed, but the hunters will also jump in front of you when you try to run away from them. The hunters are dangerous enough, but right after that you get locked in a boss room with not just one, but two bullet sponge zombie alligators. And this time you don't have a gas canister to shoot and blow them up immediately. They end up cutting you off from both sides and will begin attacking you from the back and front. Now for some reason this game has a mechanic where you almost never get attacked by enemies directly behind you, but it still means that in a situation like this your view and escape points are incredibly limited. Goddamn alligators are so fat I can't walk around them. I honestly have no idea how to deal with these guys besides resorting to the old RE1 tactic of standing still while unloading my most powerful stuff into them. So I'd just say don't go this route, don't even bother with them. You're just wasting time, health, and ammunition. The other path leads you into another fork, but not before being introduced to another Mr. X tyrant. If you didn't encounter him in the hospital, this might be the first time you even meet Mr. X in this game. And man, isn't it anticlimactic? Especially since there's a more than generous enough distance for you to unload into him. The fork leads to either a roof and warehouse full of clean who are still fairly easy, or CLUB TYRANT! which is fucking full of them. But they're still tyrants, so they're incredibly slow. If you don't want to shoot them and take the ammo that they drop, you can easily just walk around them. 
But man, there are so many tyrants in this game. Remember when Mr. X was such a big deal in Resident Evil 2? How he couldn't be brought down and he just kept pursuing you through the entire game? Well here they're just spammed everywhere, and they can be easily taken down with a pistol. I definitely get the impression that the devs did not understand what made this enemy so special in the original game he premiered in. It's just another enemy for you to spam everywhere. Cause that makes for good content, right? Now I know this isn't how the game exactly wants you to play it, and you are rewarded for doing otherwise. But but if you're just playing this game once or something without the intention of 100%ing it, then it might become apparent just how easy it is to avoid basically everything. You can run by most enemies, taking little to no damage. The only real exceptions are hunters because they can jump in front of you and tyrants because they still have the side punch attack, which you can't really see now because you're in a first person viewpoint. If you aren't heavily invested in the game, you can almost hear the devs yell at you as you run by almost every single challenge they set up. Now we've reached the headquarters of Umbrella's operations here. Protagonist Man finds a computer terminal where he sees a little girl just chilling, so he begins to yell in confusion at the computer screen. Hello! Can you hear me? Who are you? Wh what are you doing? Answer me! A nearby note tells us that the boy we found in the sewer's name is Lot, and that he reported a spy to Vincent. To make things worse for mean old Vincent, all of his staff are preparing to spill the beans about his excessive discipline regarding the prisoners. So he decides to throw the biggest of tantrums and release the T-Virus and all of the monsters across town. Wait, so how is this supposed to benefit your position exactly? You go to the higher ups of this story where you failed to prevent a mass suicide, lost all of your workers, and allowed all of your bioweapons to break loose, and what, you expect a reward? Promotion? You look like the most incompetent leader ever. Is hiding the murder of your prisoners really that important? Are the executives at Umbrella really like, making monsters and highly contagious viruses by killing prisoners is totally okay, but you know what? We draw the line at you killing prisoners yourself when they try to escape. Also, this has been an issue with all of the notes so far, but none of them are written very well. Sometimes it's hard to create context as to why somebody might have written something down or why there are files left everywhere, but Resident Evil has done a pretty good job of providing the context in a reasonable manner so far. Here though, it seems like literally everybody is writing diaries and leaving them around. Not only that, but they're all written in a manner as if they were speaking to somebody instead of writing to themselves. Vincent leaving a journal where he clearly lays out his evil plan and basically gloats about how evil he is, is not a very nuanced way to present this information. And this is not the only occurrence of this lazy design. You're writing in a private journal, why are you begging for help like this is a message in a bottle? Anyway, we begin to leave the area while even more Mr. X's try to stop us to no avail. Soon we reach a room with the little girl in it and we hear... uh... this... What? Vincent? It's me, your mother. My mother? Vincent, please, listen to your mother. I want you to leave Umbrella. I want you to stop performing those terrible crimes and just come back home. What the fuck was that? At first I thought this was the little girl trying to manipulate Vincent with a shitty old lady voice, but no. That was an actual recording they had, and that was a serious take. Was Vincent so evil that his mother actually had to call him up and ask him to stop being such a dick? What the fuck is this game? What is the tape you are listening to? Uh, I don't know. I was only listening to it because I'm so bored. Oh, okay, yeah, is that what children do during the zombie apocalypse? They listen to all the voicemails in the corporation building on the 13th floor where there are monsters literally everywhere. My brother told me to wait here! Oh! Let me go! Your brother? Leave her alone! Lily, run! Go! Kid, I have multiple fucking guns. If I wanted you dead, then your bat isn't gonna do shit to stop me. There's a file in the computers that talks about how they wiretapped Vincent's phones, which I guess is how they got that bizarre recording from his mother. The file mostly just repeats what we already know, but it does tell us that Vincent killed his colleague in order to become the leader here. Because I guess he just wasn't an evil enough meanie yet. This is skipping a bit of ahead of the retrospectives, but uh, without giving spoilers, I think that Umbrella probably wouldn't care much about that. In fact, based on other characters' actions, it might actually be encouraged. Also, I kind of feel like I should mention this real quick. As you leave the building, you come across a giant-ass hallway sensor? 
For some reason, you're given the option to walk over to the card reader and turn it off, or just run right through it, trigger an alarm that lasts for this room only, and send in a mutated liquor enemy that you can casually run past before it even enters the room. This is the only time that something like this is implemented, and I don't even know why this option is here. In the garage to the building, we find the Grenade Launcher. This version is taken from Resident Evil 2, which means that the grenade rounds have the unneededly complicated fire pattern where all of its damage is divided amongst multiple shots, most of which go right into the ground. So since we have control of our aim here, you have to be sure to either hit enemies when they're directly in front of you, or you have to be sure to awkwardly aim the shots so that way they arc further away from you. Again, it's a thing that seems like it wasn't very thought out before it was transferred into a game that it wasn't meant for. The children run into a river and somehow manage to evade all of the monsters ahead despite this literally being a single path including the iconic vibrating spiders. I don't know why this happens, but it seems consistent on multiple playthroughs and alternate hardware. They just sit there, vibrating until you get close. And with the existence of spiders comes the poison condition. But just like the key items, there's almost always a blue herb right next to the poison inflicting enemies, so it might as well not even be a thing. You're not gonna die of poison while you're in the room fighting the poison enemies, trust me. We find the children's home, along with the girl, Lily, who's hiding in the closet. She says that her brother ran to the factory, so now our journey has turned into a rescue mission for a boy that really should have been killed the instant he left the house. His bat is not gonna protect him against a hunter, I, I promise you. This leads us to a cable car where we reach the last of the optional routes. First option is to go into a cave with a handful of liquors, which means it's the easiest path. Basically just a straight line. Then there's Cleaner Forest, where you run down a scenic dirt path where the cleaners run into your sights and die instantly. And lastly is my favorite, where we get caught up in a sudden, completely silent landslide. Miraculously surviving a fall down a cliff, and then we have to run out of Tyrant Canyon. There's just a shitload of tyrants spammed everywhere, and you're running like hell every time you see one. It's so fucking lazy and ridiculous, I love it. This is also an area where you can see that the tyrants were not programmed very well. Take even a single step outside of an easily identifiable range, and the tyrants will immediately de-aggro, allowing you to fill their backs full of lead. It was clearly designed this way so that way whenever you first enter the area you're not immediately ganked by all the tyrants at once, but I guess they didn't take into account what would happen if somebody walked a few feet away from them. Whoops! Anyway, we find the entrance to the factory and we enter the, um, obligatory lab segment. Wait, uh, that's usually saved for the end of these games. Are we already at the end? How long is this game? Oh, this game's only two hours long. We're already at the end and it feels like nothing happened. So we're at the lab and the game makes sure to throw in the last of the unused RE2 assets. This is where I want to talk about the music of the game. Now, I'm not a music critic, but I kind of like this. The music was very heavy but fast paced, which made sense for this game specifically since it was trying to be an action shooter. It's something that I'd listen to in my own time, but you know, I thought, I thought it was pretty good. But then we reach the late lab level, so a very special shout out needs to be given to this. I am getting some massive Resident Evil 1 basement vibes. That's right, music is always the scariest when it feels like you're just pressing a bunch of random notes. And it definitely isn't headache inducing. So here in the lab is where we obviously get everything laid out about where we are and what purpose it serves. We are on Sheena Island, which is used as a tyrant manufacturing plant. I'm sure that's the excuse used to explain why there are so many tyrants all over the fucking place, but that's not an excuse for why it's so tone deaf. Here on this island, they need to extract a particular chemical called beta hetero non serotonin, which is certainly a bunch of words that make sense and is not clumsily thrown together terms that sound vaguely medical. This chemical is crucial to making tyrants, and the only way it can be produced is inside teenage brains undergoing intense fear. That's achieved by performing brain surgery on the prisoners without anesthetics. 
Well, it sure is in theme to make the necessary component be fear. But, but imagine if they had to make their prisoners happy instead. So instead of brain surgery, they just like take them to Disney World or something. Eventually, we find Lot deep inside the lab after opening dozens of advanced lock mechanisms and killing tons of monsters. So I have no fucking clue how he got to this point, and I don't think the game does either. We rescue him from both falling and the hunter, and that's when he finally feels comfortable enough to reveal what he knows. Turns out that we have not been playing as Vincent at all, but instead we are the spy that was trying to take down the island, and our name is Ark Thompson. What are you talking about? It's not your fault. Vincent is the one who caused everything. Well, I mean, I... You? What do you mean? You're the detective. Your name is Ark Thompson. What? Really? I'm not Vincent? Then why did you run away from me? Because I'm the one that told Vincent about you. Also, Lot is a very good boy. You are a good boy, Lot. This is when all of the memories start coming back to Ark. That's right. At the request of my friend, Leon S. Kennedy, I came here to investigate. Oh, yes! I remember! I remember everything! Ark is literally a Mary Sue OC shoved into the Resident Evil canon. He's friends with Leon S. Kennedy from Resident Evil 2. He has no flaws in his personality beyond what is imagined up due to his temporary amnesia. He's basically unkillable through everything that he's endured up to this point. And he is so skilled with weaponry that he is capable of taking out all of these tyrants, the same tyrants that hunted Leon for an entire game, with ease due to his limitless ammo supply. I mean, I would certainly call him an idiot, but I don't think the game thinks that. He's just boring. He's another good guy protagonist to throw into the Resident Evil protagonist pile. The crux of his character in this game was that he felt guilty for all the bad things he thought he had done because he thought he was Vincent. But that's quickly cleared up by just telling him that he's not Vincent. Character arc achieved? I would also like to point out that due to this game's extremely short playtime, it is meant to be highly replayable. If that's the case though, then why the fuck are all of these cutscenes around the end of the game completely unskippable? Listening to these horrible voice actors might have been amusing the first time, but by my third playthrough I really don't want to be sitting through these again. After saving Lot and sending him back through all the monsters I didn't kill to get his sister, the self-destruct sequence is activated. I have no idea why, nothing clearly set it off, but it's a Resident Evil game, so we gotta have one. It is pretty arbitrary though, because a timer never comes into effect regarding it. Since this game is all about quickly killing enemies and moving fast, I would've thought it would've been appropriate, but I guess not. Continuing to the exit tram, we pass by this game's special tyrant, the Hypnos T-Type. It's basically a mix of Resident Evil 1's tyrant and the naked T-103 model. Despite doing absolutely nothing to it, it somehow wakes up and breaks out of its container right after we leave the room. Then we get a customized ending based on what room we chose earlier in the game. If we went to the arcade, then we meet up with Discount Hunk who just says, Haha, me going to kill you. You're human. You must be the leader of the cleaner unit sent by Umbrella to destroy the evidence of this biohazard. Whatever. I can't fucking understand you. Going to the library results in Andy showing up, and props to him I guess because he tracked us all the way here just to kill the guy he believes to be Vincent. I'll kill you, Vincent. <laughs> and if we went to the hospital, we meet the real Vincent once again. I could have completed my mission. Umbrella is going to take care of me. These changes are pretty minor though, because they all end the same way. Hypnos instant transmissions behind them and gives them the old nothing personal kid, at which point they stop having any relevance. Boss time! And excluding the optional alligator fight, or the times that the game locked us in a room with a Mr. X and told us that they were a boss despite them being a regular enemy in this game, this is pretty much the first boss of the game, and we're already at the end. And this fight is pathetic. Here's a game-breaking secret that Capcom doesn't want me to tell you. If you walk backwards, almost every enemy is just incapable of hitting you, and that is never more apparent than with Hypnos here. Leave yourself a bit of room to back up and then run around him, and you will never be touched. Or, you know what? You can do this! Wow.
Wow, how embarrassing. Moving ahead, we somehow find Lot and Lily waiting for us on the train already, and we push through one last wave of cleaners before reaching the escape chopper. But oh no, Hippy Dippy is back and he is a big old grin this time! Final boss time! And despite his new look and increased speed, the backing up tactic still works just fine. Excluding this jump attack sometimes. Deal enough damage and he reaches his 100% full power form, sporting a very squishy boob heart. Final, final boss time. It's at this point where I hope you've been saving your ammo and your other weapons, or that you didn't miss a crucial weapon like, uh, like I did, because taking this guy down with a pistol is tedious as hell. I'm, I'm sorry I can't get much more in depth regarding his moveset, but again, just move backwards. He can't hurt you. He does have a grab move that you can break out of by shooting his face, but that's it. That's all there is to this. This boss is so incredibly shallow and is easily exploitable. It is a joke. This is a joke of a final boss. But finally, with Hypnos dead once and for all, Ark takes Lot and Lily into the helicopter, and they fly away just as the island explodes. Which brings us to the end of fucking psych the tyrant's still alive. But somehow it managed to jump the equivalent of multiple skyscrapers, successfully target and land on the helicopter, and all of this having happened after the island had already exploded. Just when you think it can't get stupider, Ark fires two Sidewinder missiles that fall off and immediately curve back up to hit the Tyrant, propel it forward instead of, you know, just like exploding and killing everybody, and then the second missile targets the first missile and it finally kills Hypnos. I don't know what the fuck is happening. Then the helicopter freaks the fuck out for a second, and Ark shares a caring moment of reassurance with the kids. What are we gonna do, mister? Yeah! What are we gonna do? I... I don't know. But don't worry. We can fly as long as we have fuel. Uh, I don't think that's as reassuring as you think it is. Do you know where you're going? Do you even know where we are exactly on a map? You aren't just flying into the ocean, are you? All I see is water on the horizon. How long can a helicopter fly exactly? Can one fly across the entire ocean? You know that if we run out of fuel we'll be stranded, right? Is there a plan to this exactly? And what about- Oh, the game's over. Well, none of these characters are ever seen or mentioned again in later games, so there is a somewhat likely chance that they were all lost at sea. And so that ends Resident Evil Survivor. Now we can enjoy the credits and thank all the valuable members that worked on this game. Like, uh, Kitty, and Kissed Ice Kids, and Dragon. Or tequila. At the end of the game, you get your standard grade based on your performance. The highest you can get here is an S, which comes with the infinite rocket launcher. But finding the exact stats needed for it online is surprisingly difficult. Nobody cares about this game enough to properly record this information. This hint website that's the first thing that comes up when searching says that you need to kill like 165 enemies or more, and the Resident Evil wiki says something about getting a certain number of critical shots without even mentioning the other stats. But here's what I think is the minimum requirement for getting an S rank. You need to be playing on normal difficulty, you need to kill at least 130 enemies, you never use a continue, you have very good accuracy, possibly above 90%, and you beat the game in under an hour and a half, all while never using a first aid spur. Having all the guns is apparently not a requirement. Give or take some of the numbers, you better believe I don't care about this game enough to test it on multiple playthroughs. And now, after we've beaten this under two hour long game, we can unlock nothing. Literally, the only unlockable for this game is the Infinite Rocket Launcher. There are no additional game modes, no more challenges, no more secrets, we're, we're already done. And it only took four to five hours. So, 
Resident Evil Survivor is not a very good game, and it isn't very well known for a reason. The best way to describe it would be like, if you put slightly more effort into a bonus game mode like Extreme Battle or The Mercenaries by creating new environments and a custom story, and then you package that alone as the full release of a spin-off title. The gameplay is very clearly trying to be action-oriented rather than survival horror-oriented, but nothing services it in the slightest. The controls are clunky and slow, along with almost every enemy, which makes the gameplay as a whole feel very sluggish. Actually, fighting these enemies is usually nothing more than a mindless mashing of the shoot button. If it was trying to be a fun action game, then it didn't do enough. Along with transferring over so many mechanics from the survival horror games that offer nothing to the style. Thanks to the first person perspective, the visuals have been blown up to the point where you can see every muddy, pixelated face in more clarity than the textures offer. And while it is certainly ambitious to attempt a first person game like this, the PlayStation was just not having any of it. The music is decent enough, excluding that one track where it seems like they just gave up. And the voice acting successfully crosses that line into the so bad it's good territory, though not as good as Resident Evil 1. The story is incredibly bare bones and predictable with pacing so fast that no characters or relationships are able to be well developed. It certainly is a dark story, it's got some pretty messed up things going on in it, but that's all. Even if you loved this game and you had a blast from beginning to end, you're only getting a few hours of repetitive content. It's very, very clear that this game was only created to service a gimmick controller, as so much of it is just repackaged content with none of the finesse, quality, or originality seen in previous Resident Evil games. If I were to say anything positive about this game, then I would say that its short playtime and incredibly easy difficulty offers it as at least a curiosity to experience or laugh at with friends. There's plenty to enjoy at the game's expense, but unlike Resident Evil 1, there isn't a good game underneath the awful presentation. It is at best mediocre and at worst terrible, but technically, I guess it could have done worse. I'm gonna give Resident Evil Survivor a 3 out of 10. Of course, putting it at the back of the line and the worst Resident Evil game we've played so far. And with that, we can finally move away from the Sony PlayStation and get back to the mainline games, with the game that probably should have been Resident Evil 3. Join us next time as we take a look at Resident Evil Code Veronica.